Welcome, everyone. Uh, this week, we're going to talk about uh, the thalamus. Uh, Mike uh, actually found this paper um, uh, on, and told me about it through Twitter. Uh, it's, it's, I feel like the things that they cite are more interesting than, uh, the, it's almost like this is less than the sum of its parts, but uh, <laughs> we'll go through, go through it um, uh, because the thalamus is something that we're all, uh, several of us are very interested in. And I personally have not spent enough time really looking at the thalamus and um, thinking about it. And I, I'm still not that familiar with um, things other than MD, uh, but there's a lot of interesting stuff here. And um, so let's dive into it. So just this week, actually, uh, the, I, I came across this essay in N plus one. This is sort of like a literary take on deep brain stimulation, which I highly recommend. It's on the long side, but I thought it was very well written and kind of clever. Um, and there was this bit about how the thalamus in Latin means chamber and often bedchamber. Uh, for some reason, anatomists, uh, when they were looking at the brain, they thought of all kinds of bizarre things to compare um, the brain to. And uh, so, yeah, anyway, this it crops up in this, which I highly recommend uh, reading. Uh, you don't actually come across that much sort of good neuroscience, um, like literary neuroscience, so literary or, or even neuroscience fiction that, and that I think is particularly good. So I, I liked this. But anyway, let's dive into the chamber. Um, so just to link to what we were talking about last week, um, we were talking a lot about the, the telencephalon and how that's an outgrowth of, of the hypothalamus, but the diencephalon is the ancestor or the, 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 the part that corresponds to the thalamus, which is a, a, pre, a sort of earlier segment in that neuromere model. So this is that hypothetical um, uh, ancestor, and we have this yellow bit is what becomes the, the, um, the thalamus and also these other things, the tectum, which was important and kind of people often don't even realize how important it is even in, in primates and humans. Um, so, so this uh, becomes part of a crucial circuit. Um, as, and we talked about it a little bit, but, um, but yeah, so the, the, um, it's kind of like the main source of input to the cortex. And uh, it's a good opportunity to like, see where it is. I always find it difficult to think about the brain in 3D um, despite being in a neuroanatomy lab. Um, so you have to kind of think of this, uh, this bow plan, the basic plan as a, it's a sagittal view of this hypothetical structure. Now you're looking at a, at a sort of another sagittal view, but now it's turned and uh, many things have been convoluted, but the basic structure before you reach the pallium can still be viewed in this, in this diagram. Um, so sitting on top of, of, this, of the brain stem, which is this, this, these bits here, is, is the thalamus, the two thalami. Um, and it kind of helps to know where the, the ventricles are because they're right next to that. And also where the, um, the caudate and putamen are. So, so you kind of get your orientation um, uh, of where all these things are with the help of the ventricle to some extent. But there's this weird loop that goes, it starts dorsal and goes, ventral and lateral. And so you're gonna to have to keep that curve in mind if you want to know where these things are. A lot of people don't even bother. Um, oh, right, so that's where the thalamus is. And uh, it has all these nuclei, um, which are which traditionally, as this paper talks about, um, uh, have been assessed using basically functional um, uh, studies so and uh, anatomical track tracing. And uh, th this diagram, which is from someone's, um, from, from a thesis actually, um, is useful because it shows where um, uh, things get sent. And typically these connections are bidirectional. And in fact, I don't know about this, but are there any unidirectional projections from, thalam from a specific th thalamic region to a specific cortical region or um, striatum? And not actually, well, obviously striatum doesn't send projections back to, um, to thalamus, but if you know of any, I'd be curious to know of like asymmetrical connections between cortex. There's, so AIP has a weird asymmetry with thalamus. AIP stands for anterior entroparietal cortex. Right. Okay. Um, so okay, cool. Um, yeah, I suppose parietal is just one mystery. Maybe we should like dedicate a session to the parietal cortex. I feel like it, I have no clue. What AIP is about also it. weird because it's the only thing posterior to the central sulcus that uh, has um, cholinergic projections to it. Good point. 
So yeah, let's do this. Maybe next week or some soon. Let's 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 do a, like focus on the on the priority cortex. Um, anyway, these are the nuclei. The ones that like if you study if you study prefrontal cortex like I do, you'll you'll be particularly aware of of MD medial dorsal up here. This blue, sometimes called dorsal medials, so you have to keep track. Um, and uh, the ones that connect to um, the basal ganglia to the striatum include. Um, well, just Mac, Mac, which are the ones that project to the striatum? Uh, so the, the intralaminar nuclei are the That's ones right, that yeah. they typically talk about. Um, yeah. I mean, there's, I think there's differences across species and it's, you've got to take everything with a bit of grain of salt. Yeah. Yeah, noticed, typically yeah. those, the little uh, intralaminar nuclei in there, CMPF, um, and I mean, it's a bit tricky. Um, I, you know, they're kind of like the hyper matrix type in Ted Jones's terminology. Yeah, I'll talk about what the matrix and call out in a sec. Um, but, uh, but yeah, if anyone wants to pause and ask more about this, we have people who know a lot about it more than I do. Um, so so yeah, that these um, and the output of the basal ganglia, which is the globus pallidus, right, goes back to CMPF, right? Typically, the motor related thal thalamic area mostly. So, and so, so what was the MD to some extent? Well, maybe the, the so does the globus pallidus project to MD? Yeah, so this is where, um, you know, a lot of the anatomy gets really tricky um, <laughs> because uh, MD gets much bigger over the course of phylogeny, um, you know, in primates much more, more so than rodents, and then again in humans more than primates. Um, so there's, there's some evidence, there's a really nice review by Provosto and Somner that, that kind of goes into this and um, makes the argument, though a lot of it is sort of speculative, that the MD is recipient um, or is much larger and then recipient. There's certain zones of it that are recipient to the globus pallidus. And then there are other parts that are recipient of um, sub, uh, subcortical structures like the cerebellum. So the deep cerebellar nuclei. Um, and then, you know, there's obviously lots of other co complex kind of corticothalamic, thalamocortical loops going on as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I'd say it's a massive area that we need more research in though. Um, yeah, and heaps. Of, I could speculate wildly if you want, but it's probably best to keep it. Um, it will be, kind of yeah, wrong. I don't have that many slides. So well, we'll, no, we'll, we'll yeah. probably get to that anyway. Um, uh, yeah, here's just another uh, uh, figure to see kind of where things are. And another thing to kind of which threw me off initially was that you'll see the term ventral thalamus every once in a while, and which is another term for the thalamic reticular nucleus, which is uh, an inhibitory kind of sheet that actually sits on top of the thalamus in primates. So you'll be like, why is it called ventral? It's, it's sort of more ventral in rodents. And this will, I find it very confusing, but it's just something you'll come across. Um, it's not particularly ventral in primates. That's this is just like just a warning in case you come across this. I should, um, I should jump in here as well, Johan. Uh, when I had the pleasure of watching Louis Puelis do a masterclass for four days, which was as intense as it sounds, yeah. Uh, a couple of years ago in Melbourne, um, one of the things that he pushed on was that the embryological um, sort of background of the reticular nucleus is quite distinct from the rest of the thalamus or the, what we would call the thalamic nuclei. And so he he balked quite a lot at calling it the reticular nucleus of the thalamus. He preferred us to call it the reticular nucleus and then leave it be. And one of the benefits of doing something like that is that you can start to think of the RTN or the reticular nucleus, I, I even like to call it that, um, as sort of more in the category of something like the um, zona inserta or mm. other structures like that, that have this kind of really important regulatory role, predominantly GABAergic, um, and you don't have to necessarily think of it as part and parcel with the rest of the thalamus, which is oftentimes doing something quite distinct from kind of blanketing everything in this kind of um, few to many inhibitory kind of story that we've talked about. So anyway, I, just, I found that quite helpful. Yeah. So just yeah. trying to pull these things apart. So, so yeah, just in case you know, we're already kind of diving into details. Most of the uh, of the neurons that project out of the thalamus, almost all, I mean, all of them are are excitatory, so they express glu glutamate. And um, uh, the, th th the TRN reticular nucleus is almost exclusively uh, inhibitory. So you can think of it as so you can think of uh, like collecting the sources of inhibition on the thalamus is a useful way to think. So, so uh, apart from the the TRN the thalamic reticular nucleus, there's mm -hmm. zona inserta. There's the globus pallidus internal, uh, and I believe the substantia nominata also. Is that right, Mike? Um, so there's That's like a, a handful of all these inhibitory sources. Yeah. The other one, the lateral parabrachial nucleus comes up a bit. Um, if people are interested, there's a really nice review by Laszlo Aksady and Michael Lasser that kind of goes through these, and they kind of 
split them into two big categories. One of them is a sort of like basal ganglia category, and the other one's the non-basal ganglia category. And so the, the basal ganglia category, obviously GPI and SNR are the two ones that we hear about a lot. And then in the other category, the ZI, the RTN, um, the parabrachial nuclei, and there's a few other kind of little small structures that maybe have a really prominent role in the brain, but we kind of don't know as much about them as, uh, uh, you know, just because it's, there's less work being done, but they, there's, there's interesting differences in like, the, I, I can't remember exactly the details, but like the size of the uh, projection, the um, synapses that the different um, classes make and the location on the cell body. And so there's different kinds of thoughts about whether or not you could use one to gate versus the other one might shut down other everything. And they, they make some really nice arguments in that paper. I have to go back and, yeah, if you were to say anything too. clever about it. So another thing to point out sure. get is that so LGN is is uh, very, very well studied because people thought, well, let's study vision first. And, and in some ways that has led to a sort of um, a kind of misunderstanding about the rest of the thalamus. Because you know, in, in many ways, LGN is sort of an exception um, uh, compared to other thalamic nuclei. Um, uh, so but one place where, where, and here's, this relates to actually interspecies differences. So they in rodents, the LGN is the on, is the only uh, thalamic um, nucleus that has a fair number of inhibitory interneurons. Whereas in primates, all of the thalamus so, or most of the thalamus does actually have a very large number of inhibitory interneurons. So this is a big difference between primates and rodents. Uh, they do actually mention this in this paper, so it's a good thing to keep in mind. So that and that, so a lot of people have like taken the LGN V1 circuit as kind of the canonical. Uh, corticothalamic loop, but this is like the worst thing you can do because both V1 and LGN are like exceptions uh, when you compare them to their, you know, um, kinfolk. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I was showing you human uh, thalamus just all this while, uh, the, the, the macaque uh, thalamus, it looks very similar, it's much smaller obviously, but, but in the mouse everything is a bit um, different and simpler in a way. Uh, so just to get some orientation here. Um, so we've been using this term cas from cat's cradle. So it's it's sort of what this is about. It's like, are there other ways of defining uh, uh, functional cohorts? So a caras in cat's cradle is um, a team um, that do that do God's will without ever discovering what they are doing. So these are like in, in this particular case, do the uh, uh, homeostatic or you know allostatic will of the organism. Uh, without knowing what they're doing. So the, in principle, it would be really cool to, to find like counterintuitive like teams that sort of form and then break up. And it would be nice if this, that was what this paper was about. It's sort of gestures in that direction, but not quite. Um, so, so what they're basically talking about is, it's almost like a grant proposal or something like <laughs> the, to say, oh, we would like to study gene expression patterns in the thalamus. Um, and link them up with other things. So, so, so they convince you, yes, gene expression gradients exist. You can sometimes think of them as discrete, sometimes not, probably best not to think of them as discrete, even though all the diagrams, as we'll see, suggest discreteness. Um, so yes, so their proposal uh, is that the, um, the different ways of looking at the cell types in, in thalamus um, can, are similar but different. So there's genetics, connectivity, computation, and uh, somehow they would like to tie them all together. Uh, right, so traditionally people have looked at morphology, neurochemistry, and physiology, uh, and also obviously connectivity, but if you're just looking at cell types, people don't typically talk about connectivity as a type. Maybe they should, but this is these three are the ways that people typically talk about this. So, there's this whole trend, particularly in the rodent world, but in, in, in neuroscience in general, to think that the genetic identity of, of a cell is the ground truth. Like all this time we were using things like morphology or firing, or categorizing um, firing patterns, all that is like hand waving, but now we know the actual thing. I'm kind of skeptical of this. <laughs> and um, I, I mentioned this actually last time, and, and um, but also I was actually bringing this up with Helen, my PI, uh, that, like Louis Poyas, for instance, uh, for good reason says they're looking. When we can do genetic sequencing uh, and combine that with developmental studies, we know the ground truth. I think that's all right for developmental purposes. But in other situations, when you want to compare across species, 
um, uh, only looking at the genetic uh, expression pattern might be misleading. And the example I gave last time was fast spiking neurons in the striatum. Like the striatum is clearly homolog homologous across these vertebrates. You can definitely and very easily identify it. And you can identify medium spinal projection neurons, the main workhorses of the striatum, and these fast spiking interneurons. But the fast spiking interneurons don't express a parvalbumin in primates. They tend to express calretin. And clearly, because those are proteins, there will be a difference in genetic profile. So the way I was thinking about this is that it's possible that when you have a genetic program, like a, which is for, for our purpose is more like a kind of attractor state than a program in the traditional sense, you could probably swap out one gene for another uh, while preserving some sort of overall pattern. Um, so it's sort of like saying that there are invariant, like higher level invariance patterns that come from the overall developmental um, scheme that mean that any specific genes could be swap outable, uh, where you get small changes in function. So this is something to keep in mind, I think. That, so um, yeah. is, there, is there any reason that you can't um, define or like these kind of cell categories or like classes or whatever mm -hmm. by the, um, by the by their inputs essentially i think it's a fair thing to do actually and and it's, it's just that in some places you don't you know might not know where to get started mm -hmm. like like um and that's a methodological issue right because you, yeah. you can never or you can almost never inject like a single long range neuron you can sometimes do this in most slices right but um uh so so when you're doing an injection in like a primate or something, um, you're actually you're you it's going to be uptake in lots of cells. So when you see where they go um, using retrograde or anterograde, the you're going to get a mix of different cells. So you're going to see cells like sometimes axons will branch and go to different places, or you're getting a heterogeneous pattern. So it's tricky in a, in to go in the detail of it. But yeah, I think it would be good to to pay more attention to connect connectivity, but they'll probably end up getting just different results. Because part of the re reason for heterogeneity is, is like, it's a functionally useful, right? So, so you'd, I, like, you'd want things that have received the same connections to have different neurochemical patterns and vice versa, right? Things that have the same neurochemical pattern projecting to different areas, because then you get make use of the diversity to some extent. That might not always be true because to some extent, the genes will guide the axon tip during development. So gene expression patterns will be correlated, some genes will be correlated with the developmental pattern. So, so, so you may actually get some redundant information that way. Yeah, no, I think that, but I mean, like the, the those kinds of symmetries are useful, but they're they're made to be broken in some in some way. That's, <laughs> That's exactly uh, my point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It, it, it does seem like biology will like as soon as it sees a symmetry, it breaks it, right? <laughs> so yeah, that's exactly. But what but, it, but it also <laughs> seems to kind of exist near to a symmetry, even if it's it's not completely symmetric. You know what that reminds me of? This is a big leap, but there's this concept of maximally even rhythms in music and like human, the human ear yeah. yep. likes yep. stuff yep. that's maximally even without being perfectly even because the perfectly even rhythm is boring as hell. That, but that's a tangent. Ask me about that later. Um, so so here they're talking, even though they were trying, trying to suggest just, that- Just before you go, just yeah. I have one other quick thought. Um, when you were talking about the genes that could swap in and out a little bit, I was reminded a little bit of um, gene duplication events in in natural selection. That right, you, you get the there's certain sort of working ordered kind of functional systems that kind of have structure to them. And if you can duplicate one of those, now all of a sudden you've got a working version and a a version that you can mess around with and play with. It's a little bit like that, but you need you need something to carry calcium. You don't really care what it is. And as long as something that switches out there puts something else there that can carry calcium, it doesn't matter if it's calbindin, calretin, and calbindin, and whatever, you could you've got the job done. That's fine. Um, it doesn't, you know, like there's no constraint necessarily on particularly using one or the other. Exactly. And so if you have a, a, a an event that causes that to happen, okay, cool. I just literally don't care. Anyone could drive me to the airport. I don't care if it's my friend or a taxi or right, a Uber. Right. Um, uh, but there are other ones that you absolutely desperately need. Like if you messed up with your sodium potassium ATPase, 
you're, you're just screwed. It's just incompatible with function. So it's right, interesting right. to think about that, like almost like tethered parts and then other untethered parts that can switch in and out. But anyway. Yeah, I have this image in my mind for this purpose of like, like when you're like stepping on, on, on like, no rocks on a, in a shallow stream, like you can sometimes step on something that's not that stable if you like, like quickly get off of it. So it's, it's, it's like, it's like as if there's these things that need to be in place that you need to use and everything else stabilizes that. Um, but uh, yeah, so basically it's another version of the copying thing. So on the one hand, you need redundancy within um, that sort of gene space. Like this particular gene, if you have several different versions of it that do roughly the similar thing, one of them can be like a test laboratory. Uh, the, the other thing is almost that all the other genes kind of define the functional space of a particular gene. So it's like when something mutates, even if you don't have lots of copies, it, the only thing that will sort of latch on uh, is, is something that fits in it's like a puzzle piece or something, like a space that everything else creates that this can fit into. That, that's the impression I get, basically. That, oh, how you can swap out something. Like that. So, um, so yeah, they're talking about, it, it seems, it looked like from the, from the abstract that they were trying to say there's a completely new way of thinking, but it does seem like they don't want to rock the boat too much. So, <laughs> so they, they start by talking about um, the, the traditional morphological cell types. So they have a hierarchy where they kind of place the genes somewhere in there. They're, 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 yeah, it's not clear where, how strongly they want to actually hang their um, sort of hopes on, on the genetic profiling. So, so there's an element of dithering here. <laughs> that, that, so, so yeah, they're, they're trying to kind of say, well, the genes will give you kind of what you expected from morphology and, and but also new things. So that, yeah, that, it's a bit of trying to say two things at the same time. So, so this, these are the traditional ways of looking at things. So there's these bushy neurons, bush cell, the Germans, um, uh, where you, you, so you find them in many uh, thalamic nuclei. And then you have this other type, which is these Stalin cell, radiating star-like cells. Um, and also these interneurons. Uh, so this is the traditional way that people have looked at uh, uh, anatomists have looked when they're doing Golgi stain. So that because that fills the entire cell, the dendrites and the axon. Um, and occasionally some of these graphs are a little obscure because it's a review paper and they're reviewing data from somewhere else. But they're trying to say that the, um, these cell types have variability in electrophysiological properties also, and the, those correlate with this um, RNA-seq uh, method, but I guess one would have to look at the actual citation to see what exactly they mean. But, um, but yeah, the issue is that when, when people categorize morph morphological types, they are implicitly kind of making a discrete kind of box saying, this is bushy, this isn't. And it's kind of, kind of hard sometimes to say that there's a continuum of between bushy and the other kind. Whereas gene expression patterns are lend themselves very easily to a continuum. So, so there's a bit of a, an issue. This is, there. This, is a, this is another like equivalence class sort of thing, right? Like it's it's a this is this is where the sort of like real like categorization comes in, and like it would be nice, right? If if like there were actually equivalence classes. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, but but the, it does seem like like the genes aren't giving you what you want. Like like the story is almost like there's more continuity in the genetic but i mean if you, but if you combine but if you combine the genes and the connectivity i mean like what else can there be oh. right like if you i mean aside from you know maybe the, like the local chemical environment right well, like the, that, that's exactly what i was thinking of so so if morphology isn't determined by genes it's not something they've said in this paper but it's something you kind of have to think right if i if i see um like if, and if I, like if we have reasonably good inter-experimental agreement, which I think is possible, um, that these are qualitatively different types based on morphology, but the genes don't reflect that. Then what else do we have? But like you said, kind of connectivity and local environment, which are kind of two word sides of the same coin. Yeah, yeah. Because like imagine like developmentally that like some of the earliest developing um, regions, both cortical and subcortical, are sort of firing away in some regions, right? That provides an kind of atmosphere for, for some of the dendritic arborization to, to take place. So, so it's something to really keep in mind because like 
the there is more evidence that you know which we don't need that much more but it's good to keep keep it in mind that the, the gene isn't programming everything the, the genome isn't programming every little thing in um, for the cell type so again they have this this example of six genes that could be used to combinatorially define thalamic nuclei which seems like a pretty discrete set but at the same time they want to say that maybe discrete characterizations are not a good thing so yeah it's a little and it's a bit the, the take home message of this paper is not so clear because it does seem well, like they well, are well hold on one second I, I i would say that for modelers anyway discrete categorizations are fantastic things oh, yeah, and we should use them <laughs> yeah yeah 100 like like we would love to have qualitatively different cell types um and then add continuum noise on top of that um if everything is just a continuum, then it's very hard to get any, any get anywhere. So it's good to know, and, and it would be nice to know whether these gene expression patterns, like like some future geneticist uh, a gene could like find out if you could selectively get test um, axon terminals. It would be really interesting to know if you can identify axon terminals using genetic methods. Um, separately from local expression in the cell body. I don't know how this is all like the ingenuity of, of, of experimentalists in like saying we control they, the list and use something do, to suppress don't they, something else. Don't they, don't they have mitochondria or is that, no, that's just the, that's just the dendritic spine. Like, yeah, 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 it's just the dendritic spine. To actually tell whether it's a dendrite. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dendrites have them, but, but axon terminal. Although actually, I think I heard somewhere, I think I heard somewhere that, that there's like one set of connections like uh layer six to something or other that has mitochondria in the in the axon oh. terminal i i don't know if this is true or not i think i just heard it somewhere sounds vaguely familiar i should look into that but yeah there, there's it's 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 like this is the kind of data where you're like well it's telling me something <laughs> but i don't know what um so so then they give go through examples and here i think um Following the, the the papers that they cite will be quite interesting. So they talk about the so they, they basically talk about three or four examples of subpopulations where they talk about uh, connectivity, genetic profiles, um, uh, and and like uh, morphological well, basically anatomical locations. So inside paraventricular um, thalamus, they found these two genes quite neatly divide uh, and seem to correlate with whether the the projections um, go to infralimbic versus prelimbic. So in, in rodents, they don't really have a prefrontal cortex. So they have this sort of lumped premotor um, kind of thing, this limbic. Basically, they have something that's uh, homologous to medial and orbital prefrontal cortices in humans. And um, they um, so infralimbic uh, kind of roughly corresponds to, to I get the direction of this, but there, there's, um, I think prelimbic is sort of like a little bit like 32. Um, so, but anyway, and you can infer that based on connections with the amygdala, for instance. So I mean, inf IL and PL um, both connect to the amygdala, but in sort of opposite ways. Um, and that's true of POFC, posterior orbital frontal cortex in 32. Uh, but there are more medial and orbital prefrontal areas that, so you have basically more, more diversity and complexity in the primate. Um, so yeah, so, so they are talking about different ways of ident identifying subnetworks. And uh, but this functional stuff is, is worth following up. Um, this idea that in activating the anterior but not the posterior paraventricular increased reward seeking. Um, in conditions of negative valence. Like there's so, so many caveats and controls and like applications in these things that you really have to re read what the behavioral study was to make any sense of it. But um, but it's pretty interesting to think that there are these like different limbic priority maps basically. Um, and traditionally we've thought about them in terms of just cortical function or striatal function. But thinking of them as loops. So thinking of the functional unit as not a brain region, but a loop is, is I think what the field really wants to get to, but they don't necessarily know how to get there in a principled way. But this, this is gesturing in that direction, I think. Um, 
So right, so there are these two subpopulations that form independent thalamocortical loops, and in, in this particular case, sort of mutually antagonistic to some extent. I think to point out that um, uh, is that people continue to use the term relay, and then simultaneously people will get irritated and say, "No, the thalamus is not just a relay." But one reason that to continue using that word at once in a while is that there are no local excitatory connections in the thalamus. So at best, you can get some local competition via those interneurons that exist there. But for the most part, the, th the, the, the thalamic excitatory neurons are not very much aware of each other. Wait, hold on a second. Hold on a second. That <laughs> is, that's, that's true? Yes, that's true. Can, can <laughs> I get a confirmation yes. from somebody here? <laughs> Wait, can you make uh, the statement again, Johan? Um, <laughs> there are no local excitatory, like like individual thalamic excitatory neurons do not excite each other. Correct. This is really yes. okay. Yep. Yeah, that's um, correct. This is why I okay. Nick's comment before, right, about huh. the thalamus kind of buying the cortex some freedom from blurriness. Um, well, but then I mean, like, but then there's uh there's tons of uh rebound excitation in in the thalamus though so that's the that's the the other side of it yes there's the invite yeah they mentioned that you know um the, the and there's lots of the interneurons and they're um right so there's lots of like integration via gaba which to, to the extent that that rebound stuff matters across neurons i guess is the implication but yeah, yeah, yeah. i mean like it's it's like effective excitation in some way Right, so yeah. like you're mm. causing you're causing the the, the 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 neighborhood to to burst, but the um, but it's yeah, it's actually it, it's probably simpler, right? So so another thing can, I, can I actually can I actually ask about? Are you going to stay on this topic? Or you're oh, no. going to bounce because because um, I'm actually super I'm curious about this rebound thing. Sorry, but, oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, what? oh, I just I, I was chatting with a, a neurosurgeon yesterday in the UK who was bringing up. This concept of like rebound excitation and I, I was just sort of daydreaming about it a little bit and trying to work out whether or not it was a real thing that the nervous system uses or just some weird function of you know having a slice and then sticking oh, no, it I, I, I'm fairly certain break. this happens I'm fairly certain this happens quite a bit um, okay yeah can you can um, you give me a little like primer on um on so why, that's what this is what the this is what the, the TRN does is uh inhibits the thalamus and then uh, after after the thalamus recovers from that inhibition from the trn then it starts to burst this is like this is supposedly i mean you know i haven't like well, i've done the experiments myself but like <laughs> but this is supposedly the origin of sleep spindles I mean, it doesn't even have to be um recovering from the inhibition it's actually the inhibition itself the hyperpolarization itself <clears throat> Can activate both the H and the T currents in the neighboring TC cells. So, like, like literally, you get you know tonic. If you have, if you're starting at, at awake and you're getting um, uh, an awake thalamus that's just boring and it's doing you know stereotypical relay kinds of things, and you know a little bit of spikes at a time, a TC cell gets really activated and that is able to cause the TRN to activate and then cause a lot of inhibition to go out. All of a sudden, a bunch of neighboring TC cells may get inhibited enough to actually turn online their really interesting currents that enable the bursting to happen and so forth. So by, mm. it's so it's, yeah, it's weird. By, <laughs> by causing inhibition to happen, the TC cells yeah. can actually activate each other in their bursting form as opposed to the right. tonic form. So one way to... the story is that isn't that story that bursting is more common during sleeping states and, Absolutely. and different anesthetic states rather than yeah. Yeah. wake states. And I know that there still are bursts. Like Murray Sherman had a paper yep. that showed there yep. were some bursts from awake, but it's certainly like the exception rather than the rule. So I guess this yeah, is where I wonder yet. just how functional are these. Uh, but I mean, it's, like the, it's like the functional, right? we we were we were modeling the the beta events as as bursts from thalamus. So, I mean, like, I don't know, I don't actually know how common they are in, in different species, but that's, I mean, they were, they were consistent anyway. And sleep spindles are okay. extremely common across different species from what I understand. And I mean, functionally, well, I think uh, there's a lot of evidence. I should to define functional, my, my apologies. Oh, sorry. I just meant like, like it does something, I guess. That's what yes. I No, no, I'm, I'm yeah. absolutely happy with that. I was thinking more along like, the lines but I, of, I, you know, yeah. Okay. Well, I think that. Um, in nest hippocampal ripples in sleep, that's all I was going to say, is that it seems like 
hippocampal ripples can happen at certain phases in spindles and the spindles seem to like maybe carry those in uh in a phasic way into sleep into slow oscillations into the cortex like it's possible that you know spindles are the grease that get information from hippocampal ripples encoded into cortex during sleep at least that's the theory anyways yeah yeah and there's plenty of spindles uh well like at least sharp wave ripples during wake which are kind of you mm -hmm, know getting mm -hmm. close to that kind of thing so yeah it's yeah, cool no, I'm, I'm, I'm just really curious about this yeah yeah so i sorry johan you kept getting interrupted um, <laughs> Uh, no, this is great actually because this is more interesting than what's in the paper. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, the 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 so when I made made this comment about this lack of a like, local excitation, right? It's not a claim about lack of correlation among thalamic neurons, right? <laughs> because of what Austin and Robert are talking about. So, and another way to think about it is that the the way that thalamic ne neurons can become correlated with each other is via their projections to cortex or the consequences in basic ganglia a and the trm so so a, a, a group of thalamic cells excite the the trn which can then in a, in a kind of spread out way uh, recruit a bunch of, of um thalamic neurons which then get suppressed and then burst all together why might you want something like this right I, I, this is a complete speculation right but it's almost like when we think functionally, we often think in terms of like what is currently firing and think of what's not firing as somehow not performing a function. But not, to fire, not firing is useful. When you need to do something, not firing is part of the job. But like, as I've talked about, to, I've probably said this too many times already now, but I'm very interested in breaking out of a competitive loop. And what I mean by that is that on-center off our networks are too good at their job. <laughs> that, that you can get a situation where once you suppress something and, and you have positive feedback, such as can happen locally within cortex or thanks to thalamocortical loops, then how do you break out of it? Now, rebound excitation is a great way for somebody. It's almost like somebody who's been quiet all the time gets more and more irritated by the fact that they've been quiet and then says, hey, <laughs> listen to me. Now, I, I haven't implemented this, but it's not hard to imagine that one of the things that could get you to break out of a particular winning loop is rebound excitation. So it's like the like no off-center like competitive inhibition, no lateral inhibition should dominate for too long. Um, and obviously there are many ways that you could get out of that situation, but this could be one way to to kind of encourage turn taking you know um, so that, that's how I've often thought about it to like can, can I add? One thing, which yeah, is I think just he's a, just trying to get us to use our mute buttons, guys. Yeah, I just want to add one thing that like, I think a good example of that is not necessarily like disabling something, but is, um, I think there, there's even the Bajanov lab, I can't remember what year it was, maybe 2014, but they had a paper where um, they, they had a cat, and I think you can only do this in like Canada or something. But they had a cat and they decorticated a small part of Japan. cat <laughs> cortex. Oh, actually, it, was, it might have been Japan. Yeah. But they found that when they disconnected the cortex, the thalamus connection for that one patch, the slow wave oscillations became much less synchronized with like nearby parts of cortex. And that's just like a really nice piece of evidence that supports a lot of other evidence that um, at least the rebound excitation, the not just like in sleep spindles, but at least, but even in the slow wave oscillations, they think that um, the rebound excitation and bursting that happens in the thalamus, it's it's thought to maybe um, phase shift or like correct and get get the the large scale sleep slow wave oscillations like all on the same page, and so ba basically get them to to restart at a certain point um, and then carry that point over. So that you're not, rather than having a whole bunch of completely out of phase things, you get these, I mean, maybe like trap or traveling waves that, that, you know, for a long time, we thought were literally, uh, literally actual, you know, traveling waves that were maybe maintained by cortical cortical connections. And now it's, that's possible, but it's more likely that you're getting for sleep slow waves, like cortical thalamocortical synchronization. And it's not always doing it, but it's doing it sometimes enough to keep everybody, you know, on the same page uh, so, over a night's sleep. We so then there's, th but then there's also the the um, supposedly the claustrum. If you activate the claustrum, then you wind up with slow waves in cortex. 
Hmm. So yeah. one way to think about this one. And I have no idea if that's like, <laughs> yeah, if that's like a one-to-one -one thing like, or if it's a... <laughs> I mean, the slow wave is like, is that there's so many different ways you can get it and mechanisms sure. can get it. Like, that's one of those things that, oh, hi, Rob, by the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> that. um, but uh, that's one of those things that I, I'm convinced I, I'm not like a development or phylogenetic guy, but like, there's so many different ways to get it. Like, it's got to be one of those things that is very, very, very I mean, do you redundant. Think that, do you think that that's partly just brain. because, because we like, uh, I don't know, like, in... In terms of our like, I don't know, our, our when we're looking at something, we don't really see the difference between, you know, like a three second time constant and like a two second time constant or something like that. Is that like the the because like presumably all of these things are related to um, to ion channels that have have different time constants, um, but like the, the 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 slower the slower oscillations, it seems like there's more ambiguity um for i don't know for some reason that i can't really uh I, well, that i can't explain at least for like for slow and delta and stuff there's there's like i think like s at least seven different mechanisms that have a lot of evidence to support that they happen mm -hmm. and some some of them are like specific intrinsic currents like persistent sodium for maintenance um or like a potassium activated sodium for initiation, that's what I use in my current model. But there's a lot of other like synaptic based um, mechanisms where you don't need any fancy currents, but you simply need a particular, you know, an EI balance or mm. uh, a particularly, you know, depression slash plasticity mechanism, and you can get like up and down states and stuff. So, there isn't so just one way to get there, including slow, intrinsic stuff. When we say slow, are we talking about one or two hertz? Is that is that what we're talking about? Yeah, but. I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the stuff, I think a lot of the models can get up to into like Delta, like maybe three or four Hertz, but a lot of them also don't push it that far. Okay. Um, but yeah, slow is, yeah, slow is about a Hertz. That, that's what I'm using for it. Yeah. So, so I, I like this, uh, this um, phase thing, even though I'm not used to thinking in terms of phase, but so there's even a sort of non-oscillatory way to think about something like that. So mm -hmm. for um things that are live happening in the world the correlation is provided by the world <laughs> but if you need to perform um some sort of consolidation on things that happen right um so imagine like so let's say that when you're sort of bombarded by things that you have to actually respond to you're actually sort of quietly saving up things that uh, that were are like working memory related or, or any kind of memory related or compar comparison related but they're all suppressed because you shouldn't be using all that sort of uh, reminiscing while you're kind of running away from the tiger or whatever. Now, as soon as you enter safety, that is a great time to, you know, pause and reflect and learn you know, what did we learn just now, that kind of thing, right? So you kind of want to bring various things that might have actually happened across various different time points. You, want, you might actually want to bring them all online at the same time. So if you can mark things that have been happening over the past few minutes that I cannot currently pay attention to, then actually uh, sort of uh, this kind of a, a phase related kind of reactivation could be really, really useful because then you could like bring together things that didn't actually happen at the same time um, for the purpose of synaptic learning. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, like, I mean, memory consolidation during sleep. I right, mean, right. Exactly. If you're so, asleep, then you're probably a little bit safer from being eaten exactly. by a tiger. 100%. So, <laughs> so versions of that happening while we're awake, like, like with rats, right? Like they enter these almost like sort of vaguely sleep-like states when they're just standing up, like quietly doing nothing, right? So oh, rodents do that these... all the time. Yeah. Way more than we do it. I mean, even their sleep is like, like, you know, we, you know, you remember from school that you get like the, you go into the non-REM and then sort of like your brain does this very slow thing. And then you do, it's basically a four hour cycle where you're asleep the whole time and then you repeat the whole thing. And with rodents, my understanding is like the longest time that they're in any one stage is like, I don't know, minutes or seconds oh, wow. or so. It's it's just they they sleep completely. It's it's almost like maybe it's a prey thing. I have so no idea. But they, they actually they actually score sleep differently in rodents. Like they they use 10 seconds rather than 30 seconds, uh, at least in part because and, and when they when they score rodent yeah. sleep, they only use three stages. They they don't they don't uh, they don't subclassify the different non-REM stages. Um, 
uh, basically, and there was a there was a there was a preprint that came out that was saying that um, the reason for this is because these stages are really short, <laughs> like less than ten seconds. Cool. So so yeah, there's um, you get a bunch of modelers in a room and you can speculate about every single possible event that happens in the brain as having a functional meaning. Doesn't mean they do, but <laughs> we have ideas. Uh, so yes. They do talk about TRN subpopulations, and this is something that I would like to like chase down. Um, so there are these limbic projecting TRN neurons uh, correlating with arousal level, kind of interesting. Uh, and so this actually relates to something uh, a lot of you know, um, Stefan. So one of his many projects that he was working on simultaneously involved alpha suppression. So there's this idea that when you need to suppress an entire modality, you need to use a different kind of strategy from like intramodal um, suppression. Like if you're looking at different objects and you're only paying attention to one, you don't typically use alpha suppression. But if you want to like pay attention to the vision modality and not pay attention to hearing, there's this um, type of suppress suppression activity alpha, alpha in 10 hertz. So a good candidate for how that works is actually the TRN, um, where um, you actually recruit a big chunk of the TRN and simply by virtue of the fact that the TRN itself is going to spread in a kind of uh, broad way, you'll get pretty good correlation. So some uh, types of synchrony may simply be a concept, may not simply, but maybe a consequence of attempts to shut down a large chunk of the brain. So you may get different um, physiological patterns from like, like uh, suppressing irrelevant words like something that's within a modality that's more like what like i would model using the standard on center of surround processing versus uh when you know that a big chunk of the brain is it needs to be suppressed for some reason um something like alpha suppression may actually recruit the trn and i'll actually show that there's ways that both the, the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala can do this like record a, um, excite a huge swath of, of TRN. Um, so the arousal part, I don't really know how to think about, but it's interesting. Um, so here again, they found a couple of uh, genes that are anti-correlated in some space. <laughs> and one of them seems to correlate with these more bursty um, uh, cells and the other, not bursty at all, but actually. And they were describing them as in a kind of core and shell kind of way. So this is very interesting in terms of how, like, like different patterns of inhibition of the thalamus because the TRN only inhibits the, the, the tower. So something to like keep in mind when we start making, you know, when we look into corticothalamic models, there's a whole lot of diversity here. Are, are these, are, sorry, are, is this, um, are the, the bursting activities, are these from slice or are they from, they're from in vivo? X, X vivo. Um, I, I didn't right. check what that study was. That what does X vivo that? mean? X vivo is slice, right? Okay. Uh, um, but yeah, I, ha I haven't dug into that. But, uh, but yeah, all that classic stereo, the, the sexy kind of stuff is um, slice stuff. Uh, so this might be like that, I don't know. Um, I'm not sure how you would do that in vivo. Uh, but maybe you can. I don't know. Uh, uh, the other nucleus they looked at was parafascicular. Again, one of the reasons I haven't really looked into much. And I thought this was interesting. Again, it's like just these sort of little pieces of information that I would I find, find more interesting than the overall story of the paper. So this idea that the PF to STN um, was contributing to movement initiation. What I find very interesting about this is that the STN is this hyperdirect pathway, which typically people uh, implicate in stopping uh, emotion. So this is the exact opposite of that a uh, fairly standard description of the STN. Now that's fascinating because um, partly because of, you know, what Mac was talking to us about basic ganglia outputs to upper layers, we have to think about the go and no-go pathway slightly different. So initiating a movement and stopping an ongoing movement may actually be part of the two sides of the same coin. So that's why I was quite intrigued by this particular thing. It's something to look into. Um, so, Again, the general theme here is that um, we have to think more creatively about like inhibition and about what it means to, um, to stop something 
like starting and stopping don't necessarily imply glutamate and GABA. Like we shouldn't think that way. You know, we have to think that you know GABA of what. You know, because uh, it may be that to start a fresh, completely new action, you need to have a strong interrupt signal. That's the first thought when I saw this. Something to, again, something to dig into. Uh, so yeah. So you're um, just trying to justify learning about the basal ganglia, then, Johan? <laughs> hey, basal loops ganglia. Loops loops. Uh, uh, <laughs> we've been like my, my old my advisor Dan Bullock said, that, "Well, the cortex is just protective packing from the basal ganglia." <laughs> It's like an umbrella yeah. for the important stuff down below. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, it's um like if 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 we have a sort of hand wavy model of how the brain works, it definitely involves the basal ganglia loops, right? It's like how else would you tell a story about what the brain does? It would be hard to tell it without the about the basal ganglia. So here again, we see a nice uh, apparent correlation between gene expression, physiology and anatomical position. So it's like, all this is promising, but it's like, again, I think they're not clear on whether they want to claim that they're just, the genes are just reproducing what we already knew versus selling us something new. So it's like, a, a, their summary of this is not so clear, but it's all stuff worth looking into. Uh, MD, which is um, the main thalamic source for the prefrontal cortex, it also receives projections from the amygdala, this big limbic center. Uh, also, I didn't have any figures for this one, but they, but they have some interesting uh, findings here about different kinds of long range projections related to maintaining task relevant activity patterns. And as some of you know, this is a topic I'm very interested in, working memory like uh, maintenance in, in um, corticothalamic loops, how does that work? If you're just using glutamate, you don't actually get very long time scales even with the corticothalamic loop, like, uh, and you know, a whole lot of conduction delay. So something else needs to be happening here. And I suspect that it involved this inhibiting um, and, and like those uh, calletinin and VIP cells and things like that. So the thalamus going back up to um, cortex and changing how the cortex kind of retains patterns. The thalamus itself does not seem to have particularly like, like a lot of hysteresis. If you look at, so like the excited, there are these triads in many parts of the thalamus that have, have like an excitatory and an inhibitory uh, a connection right on the same, like, I can maybe show you that next time. Um, so the idea, one theory is that these triads, you see them in LGN and you also see them for the amygdala to MD projection actually, is that if you can simultaneously excite and inhibit, you have very sort of high fidelity to this precise temporal pattern of the input which is very useful for a sensory area like the LGN and potentially also useful in the case of emotional modulation. But all of this means that if the, if, if the thalamus is capable of this very, very high fidelity responding to its inputs, then maintaining activity uh, in, is not something the thalamus on its own is doing through some, you know, uh, through integration because it's not integrated. It's basically just here is the case of relaying. So, so the integration must involve the cortex. Does, uh, the, does the amygdala connect directly to the prefrontal cortex or just through the MD? Oh yes, it connects that directly. Um, mainly means Depends on which part, right, Johan? Yeah, yeah. POFC, posterior orbital frontal, 25, 32. So basically medial and orbital. Almost nothing in 46. So that 46 is classic dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. There's hardly anything from amygdala directly there. Um, so, but and it's like a continuum. So you get massive projections to the part right behind the eyes and uh, right on the medial surface here. Um, and then it sort of falls off gradually. Uh, so you probably get a stray axon hitting the DLPFC like nine and 46, but not, not very little. So this is where that Provosto and Sumner review I was talking about before gets really interesting because one of the things they propose is that the um, granular prefrontal cortex like nine and 46 are actually receiving media dorsal populations that are more core-like than matrix-like. So they're the ones nice. that project into the granular areas, right? Hence the granular cortex. Uh, but their, their projections are actually uh, inputs. The glutamatergic inputs are coming from areas like the deep cerebellar nuclei. So you've got this really interesting kind of split then where areas like the, you know, the amygdala and you know, the nucleus accumbens are controlling parts of MD that are gaining matrix-like inputs to orbitofrontal cortex, VOPFC, 
these kind of, you know, more abstract and value-based decision-making centers that are kind of gating whether or not you collect more information or act upon something that you want. Whereas the uh, VLPFC, this area that we typically associate with working memory and, you know, with language, it's the, one of the sort of really high centers for determining what you're going to say next in a sentence, or whatever. Uh, more uh, receiving more inputs from areas like the cerebellum and maybe anticipating uh -huh. sequences and things like that. So there's a really interesting, very speculative, right? Because the, the anatomy is just not there yet. Mm. A really interesting story linking all of these together uh, into kind of one big tapestry, I think in a really cool way. Mm. Maybe we should do a session on the cerebellum prefrontal interaction. I feel like that yeah. would be a lot. I don't know how to think about the cerebellum, what it says to the rest of the brain. So this could be, could be something to do. Um, well, anyway, so, so yeah, there's some very interesting local like um, uh, projections that are probably very important. So like this preferential innovation of prefrontal PV into neurons, those are like walloping inhibition. Um, and the fact that those are involved in decision-making under uncertainty is very interesting because another, another theme I've been talking about a lot lately is how to regulate um, decision-making uh, with respect to urgency. So it's like if you're like, accumulating a lot of evidence for various courses of action, when do you say, okay, that's enough <laughs> uh, thinking, now it's time to act. One way you can do that is by increasing positive feedback. Another way, which may, be, which may produce different effects is by boosting the inhibition so that the, 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 the less um, strongly uh, justified action quickly gets suppressed. So you start ignoring things. So the fact that it's, and there's a rule actually here for this to, to remember this. So the, the core cells express PV uh, and uh, they're excited for it, but they go into the deep layers four and bottom part of three, upper part of five, where there's lots of PV neurons. So the PV to PV kind of thing happens. And the same is true with CB, cal, cal, cal so, the, so the matrix uh, thalamus, which I haven't actually talked about much, but you can get it, uh, tends to project to one, two, six a little bit. And uh, it expresses CB and projects to places where there's lots of CB neurons, um, which, which inhibit the apical dendrites and the distal dendrites. So there's a kind of um, protein-based way you can, you can infer where a thalamic uh, projection is going. Uh, right, so, so there seems to be this interesting kind of um, uh, distinction and VIP, uh, they don't overlap completely, but in primates, the, the one that we often use is calretinin, which inhibits the calbindin neurons. So they're disinhibitory neurons. Um, the fact that they're D2 plus is also intriguing. Um, the do, the D, dopamine D2 receptors um, are um, basically suppressed by dopamine uh, uh, transients. So the general idea is that a pause or a reduction in dopamine will cause the, the D2 to kind of be excitatory. And what that suggests, it, so, so this, basically the story here is that um, decision-making on the basis of faint evidence is um, potentially uh, boosting disinhibition, which what's nice about that finding is it fits in with the general logic of disinhibition, which is that if you don't have any particular reason to pick one action over another, you may want to like uh, raise the volume. <laughs> And disinhibition would be one way to do that. Um, so I like this a lot and I want to look into that. So I don't know if you guys remember the, the beta paper talk that I gave. That <laughs> just, I it, was, it, it was ultimately like all about that sort of thing. I'm, I'm, I'm very, uh, I, I, I support, support this 100%. I need to revisit that. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the, these are like, Rob, do you think other neuromodulators will play a role here as well, or do you think of it as selectively dopaminergic? I mean, like dopamine was like the 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 last thing on my mind when I was thinking about this. Like the like there are tons of I I can only imagine like um, yeah yeah I think that what we'll see it will end up seeing is that there'll be overlap, but but like diversity <laughs> heterogeneity with with respect to time scale and the type of event that triggers changes in, in these things. So, so like serotonin, dopamine, acetylcholine, norepinephrine, may all do roughly similar things on different time scales in two senses. The time scale of what it does to cortex and the time scale of the type of event required for it to change its neuromodulation. So the two time scales to keep in mind there, I think. And I think only the dopamine one, dopamine one, we have a clear idea of what the time scale is. 
the very punctate reward, and the which is the fast one. And then the slower dopamine effect is the accumulated reward rate on the time scale of seconds, minutes. Other the other I don't actually know that much about the time scales of events in the other neuromodulatory systems. Something to look into. Um, okay. So that's all I really wanted to talk about with that paper. And um, so I, they, we were, we've been talking a lot about corticothalamic loops. So I just sort of, I was looking, in fact, partly because of last week when we talked about evolution, I, I was like, well, let me look into the evolution of the thalamus. And this, um, I found this paper and Butler showing that the corticothalamic loop structure is uh, pretty conserved, which I don't, which I don't think is consistent with what Paul Chistek said in that paper, because he was trying to say that in birds and mammals, you see the closure of the loop, but it isn't present in, in fish. But well, she, in she actually said, changed this tune a little bit in a conversation I had with her a couple of years okay. ago. Um, and uh, part of the challenge comes from the naming. And so she uses a slightly different naming convention. She uses colothalamic and lemnothalamic. Right. Um, but the, I can't remember the exact details. Let me go back and dig, dig into them before I misquote her. But it was something along the lines of a better explanation for phylogenetic change in the thalamus is that there's been multiple times when different circuit properties have arisen. Um, so like a sort of example of convergent evolution rather than persistent evolution uh, mm -hmm. or position change over evolutionary time. And so for example, I found this out in a funny way. We were collaborating with a group that do zebrafish work um, up in Queensland and we we're having this really interesting chat about thalamus and, and looming stimuli and the colliculus on these things. And I, I said, oh, you know, are they core or matrix nuclei? And he just looked at me like I was speaking you know, German or something. And um, it turns out that uh, the thalamus in a zebrafish is just one cell type and it looks an awful lot like a matrix type, but it doesn't really have the kind of core type, you know, LGN direct yes. pathway to the granular layers kind of a circuit. Um, and, you know, maybe that's just like not something that a Telios fish really needs to handle its world. And then mm -hmm. when you, you know, you know, if you follow some of these really interesting ideas of the complexity of the world and the signal you're dealing with when you go into land, so for terrestrial animals becomes so much more complex than it is in the water. In the water, you kind of just deal with the, you know, the, the flow of things in front of you and you can kind of see what you can see. On land, all of a sudden there's different levels and there's you know, all this complexity and nooks and crannies and things that you just wouldn't get in, in the ocean. Um, and the smell becomes Malcolm less reliable signal. Yeah, exactly. And light becomes much, much more important. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's all these really interesting ideas about the thalamus having to kind of like expand and change and shift to take advantage of different kinds of opportunities are available that again like okay. this is all a half remembered conversation with well in that case it. that would be consistent with what paul, paul said in that paper um yeah. so he was reading off of her updated chapter in a recent time ah, okay so so anyway so i was mentioning uh core matrix so you can see them they're labeled differently uh, they use uh, specific and non-specific s and n which is what steve Grossberg often uses uh specific because the idea is that these projections from from thalamus to, to the middle layers, so four, lower part of three, upper part of five, tend to be carrying like external sensory information when you're talking about LGN or MGN. MGN. Um, and so they, in, in terms of, if you want to talk about columns, they tend to be pretty focal with respect to um, parallel columns. Whereas non-specific tends to go to these, to the upper layers uh, and is a more uh, widespread. This is a uh, widely like reported. People often say this, but it's not actually that well understood anatomically. Because amazing, right? In 2022, a lot of the um, track tracing studies that you might imagine should have been done a long time ago haven't been done at all. Um, uh, like our lab, you know, they're not you know they're not slouches. They're constantly doing things, but it takes a while. So there's a lot of track tracing studies that haven't been done yet in primates, especially, but even in mice. Um, so, um, so for instance, when Helen and Bacillus in, in our lab found that uh, projection from amygdala to TRN, that was the first time it was discovered in any species. Um, and that was only in 2011 or so. <laughs> so, you know, there are anatomical discoveries that uh, to be made uh, even now. 
Um, so yeah, the, this is from one of the, the, the papers uh, about, uh, in fact, what I was just talking about, PV and CB. Um, so you see here, the PV expressing cells tending to go to the middle and deep layers. And that's where the, you see a lot of PV neurons, which tend to inhibit uh, axon initial segment cell body. You have the CB, which are the correspond to the non-specific and kind of spread out a bit. And there's calbindin interneurons will be out there inhibiting the apical dendrites. So what I was saying about TRN, I thought might be relevant. So so um, so the so the this is a, a, a summary of findings of uh, axon terminals from injections in amygdala, posterior orbitofrontal cortex. Um, and, and looking at which parts of the TRN then project to MD. So what this is showing is that these limbic parts of the brain, amygdala and POFC, they kind of extend beyond their sector. If you, if you were to think of different thalamic regions as like corresponding to different like broad functional networks, the, these limbic areas sort of color outside the line. They're contacting um, TRN, uh, um, sectors other than uh, the, the sectors that, that project to MD. So what that means is that in principle, the amygdala, for instance, could, I'm not sure what exactly the sector is, but probably a sensory one. So in principle, the, these limbic areas can recruit the TRN from a completely different system, uh, which is not the case for anything else, pretty much. Um, so these prefrontal, I think the DLPFC also might be able to do this. So there's a handful of areas that kind of go outside of their domain in the TRN and therefore can have quite a powerful impact on uh, TRN to thalamus inhibition. And this is what I was thinking about when I was uh, talking about like alpha suppression and things like that. Like if the suppression is being motivated by, by, motivated by motivation uh, from the limbic system, uh, you may want to sort of you know, inhibit large swathes swath of the thalamus and, and who can do that? amygdala, POFC, among others, but these two can definitely do that. So they, they have a kind of uh, functional story, which I won't really talk about too much, but I basically took this amygdala um, projection to um, TRN uh, and turned that into a, a simple model of, of uh, so there's this idea that the TRN is like an inhibitory gate that needs to be opened. Um, so I, I I call this the emotional gatekeeper. So one of the gatekeepers is many. So you could think of all the different things that influence the TRN um, as like different sorts of gatekeepers. And then in general, you can think about the basal ganglia also as a sort of different kind of gatekeeper circuit. Um, so what you can see is how um, these sort of uh, projections that in change corticothalamic modes can have knock-on effects and, and change how corticothalamic areas compete with each other um, and how, say, something in the a more limbic and prefrontal plan-related corticothalamic loop can interact with something related to salience here in the, in the amygdala and influence uh, selection of different um, corticothalamic loops in sensory parts of the, of the circuit. But yeah, um, so yeah, that's all I, all I put together for today, but we can dive in and zoom in on any of these uh, concepts. that we've touched on. But yeah, the TRN is a pretty um, interesting uh, structure. And I found this really cool paper after this paper came out by from Barry Connor's group, Crandall et al, 2015 or something like that, where they showed that if you um, excite a deep cortical, um, I think they did this in S1 um, in mice. They, they, they excited the deep cortical pyramidal neurons and they were able to disinhibit the thalamus. So, and that required sustained firing. So, so they were looking at thalamic inhibition from TRN. And so when there was not much uh, firing in the deep layers, the inhibition dominated. And when they allowed the activity to persist for tens or so was this, was this, was this a, like, 
GABA A inhibition, GABA B inhibition. I mean, like what channels were being opened here? Because the apparently, apparently the the like when you're dealing with the pelvis, you don't have to deal with excitation at all. Like <laughs> all you have to do is inhibit the thing. <laughs> so so the um, so I don't remember if they looked at the specific channels because they were just looking at the you know IRIC. They did channel uh, rhodopsin in yeah. layer six CT cells. So they yeah. wouldn't have been controlling particular, yeah. uh, but I don't know if they did control experiments, but the, the really, this is a beautiful paper. And one of the reasons that it was so important, um, at least uh, in my opinion, um, Mate Scanziani and colleagues had done some really beautiful work as well, where they would kind of actually grab these layer six CT cells, which had been kind of understudied in a lot of ways, right? They're so much deeper, they're a little bit smaller, and a lot of people just hadn't really stuck the probes or really gone in to find these particular cells. And they looked at them in slice. And it's also apparently really tricky to get a slice of the corticothalamic system that keeps everything kind of like patent and allows the, the kind of connections to happen when you're in slice. So it's like a, like a heroic effort to do this experiment. And they do it and in, in slice, um, they find that whenever they stimulate optogenetically the CT cells, they get a massive inhibition of the um, the resultant thalamocortical loop that would come back. And so the conclusion was something like every time CT cells activate, you're just shutting down the thalamus. Like it's just an inhibitory signal and it, it shuts everything down. And it's kind of hard to imagine functionally how that would make sense, right? You think about the, the, the core cells, um, we think about the LGN, you know, receiving an input from the retina and like propagating it along. And if the cortex kind of just shut that down the whole time, you'd maybe like lose the adaptive ability to kind of know that whatever it was that you were observing in the receptive field was present. Um, and then, uh, you know, Crandall and Connors and Cookshank showed that it, there was actually this kind of like particular window of firing. I from memory, there was a particular frequency of firing that really mattered. Like if you stimulated yeah. at low frequencies, it didn't work and high, but then right in the middle, there's this sweet spot. And now all of a sudden you flip it and instead of it being inhibitory, it becomes excitatory in that, in that little window. And uh, yeah, it was the, the alpha, the alpha window. Um, which I think is just such a beautiful example it's, of why yeah. you've got to be really so careful beautiful. when you interpret these experiments, so, right? Yeah. But this also ties in really nicely with uh, with with Itzikevich's idea of these like integrator res. Well, this is actually no. He just he just named these things like the the, the they used to call them class one, class two, right? right. Um, but the the integrator resonator types um, and the one of the, the key properties of the, the resonator types is that they are, um, they're activated by inhibition. That's like one of the, like one of the hallmarks of it, as far as I can tell, as far as I remember anyway. Because of the low threshold calcium or one of those types of unusual channel? Uh, because topology, I don't know. <laughs> I haven't looked at this book in a while, but yeah, yeah, but uh, but yeah, that's the the face face way of explaining it. But, but yeah, <laughs> um, so yeah, this what I like about this is it's such a clear result, like it's really really clear. Um, and so what I added for this for the subsequent model um, that I that I did with um, the schizophrenia model was was to add basically to to Paul to. A top, topology uh, kind of so basically here they did they weren't able to like selectively like know whether they were contacting broadly or narrowly but i was thinking just from a functional consideration the best way to use something like this would be if you have a kind of broad uh inhibition from trn and then you can kind of puncture a hole in it with this help of us of a narrow cortical excitation so um so uh, interestingly enough i was trying to model something that nobody even asked me to model to do with divided attention. And I was thinking, well, if I have on-center off surround network, and if I have two sort of parallel um, corticothalamic loops, if I, if I want to pay attention to both of them, if I, if I boost both of them, then their inhibition will tend to cancel each other out. So I, you kind of end up getting the worst of both worlds. And I was thinking, how would you avoid something like this? And obviously, divided attention is difficult. We're not particularly good at it. So this is an interesting way to, to deal with that. So if through learning, you can get pieces, like imagine the cortex is in charge of saying, well, actually these seemingly disparate things are actually related. So you shouldn't use your off-surround inhibition to kill them off. 
then they so so then so the, those can be kind of contributing to um, saving some parts of the thalamus from off sound inhibition. So it's um, functionally it's quite a potentially powerful uh, thing to have. Well, basically, especially in humans, where you can sort of create arbitrary combinations of stimuli that are one thing, or one sort of abstract object or something like that. So, ideas for uh, next time? Or anyone want to talk more about this? I can stop the share. Um, the video.